Troy Michael Kell, an inmate at the Central Utah Correctional Facility, CUCF, in Gunnison, Utah, was charged with aggravated murder, a violation of Section 76-5-202 of the Utah Code. After being tried in a courtroom located inside the prison facility, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Troy Kell stabbed fellow inmate Lonnie Blackman to death on July 6, 1994. Prior to the attack, defendant, an alleged white supremacist, had been involved in race-related altercations with several African-American inmates, including Blackman. On the day before the killing, defendant and two of his accomplices, Eric Daniels and Paul Payne, submitted medical request forms to visit the prison's medical facility. In addition, Daniels forged a medical request form in Blackman's name so that Blackman would be transported to the medical facility at the same time defendant and his accomplices were being transported. Moments before the attack occurred, defendant and Blackman were moved from the upper tier of the building at the CUCF where they were housed to the lower tier where they awaited transfer to the prison's medical facility. Both defendant and Blackman were placed in double locked handcuffs fastened to a belt around the waist. Their feet were not placed in shackles so they could safely descend the stairs from the top tier of the cell block. By this time, Daniels had also been moved to the lower tier to go to the medical facility. Payne's request to go to the medical facility had been denied because he was in punitive isolation on the top tier of the cell block. Nevertheless, at his insistence, Payne was permitted to shower on the lower tier of the cell block rather than in the showers located on the second tier of the cell block where his cell was located. While descending to the lower tier, defendant Troy Kell removed his handcuffs with a partial handcuff key that had been altered with a homemade handle made from a metal melted plastic utensil. Defendant also produced a shank. Blackman was standing with his back to Troy Kell talking to other inmates. When Troy Kell began to stab him repeatedly in the neck, eyes, face, back and chest. Defendant was free Troy Kell to use his unrestrained hands and arms during the attack, but Blackman could only kick at his attackers to defend himself because he was still in handcuffs that were attached to his waist. Blackman's efforts were futile in any event because Payne choked and punched him and Daniels held onto his legs during the attack. For over two and a half minutes, defendant slashed Blackman with his shank, inflicting 67 stab wounds, only two of which were described by the forensic examiner as being capable of inflicting death in the short term. Despite Blackman's pleas to stop, Troy Kell continued the assault, and in fact, after walking away, returned twice to inflict more wounds, until Blackman lay motionless on the floor of the cell block. Blackman bled to death and the defendant was charged with aggravated murder. Following two pretrial evidentiary hearings, the trial court determined to hold defendant's trial in a regular courtroom located inside the CUCF. This decision was based on security risks, particular to Troy Kell, including his criminal background, prison disciplinary record, and overall prison history. In addition, several logistical problems regarding security existed in trying defendant in either of the two courtrooms available outside the prison, because most of the numerous witnesses in the case were either prison guards or high security inmates. The security risks and costs associated with transporting all of them to a courtroom located outside of the county would have been extremely high. Thus, the trial court decided to hold the trial in the courtroom located within the confine, confines of the prison. At trial, Troy Kell testified that he had in fact killed Blackman because Blackman had overtly threatened him. According to defendant, Blackman wanted to make an example of him to the other inmates to demonstrate Blackman's power in the prison. Defendant stated he believed Blackman was making a threat when he overheard Blackman say to another inmate on the day of the killing, Yeah, man, it's on. You know it. Even though Blackman made no threatening gestures toward defendant, defendant claimed that due to conditions in the prison and circumstances surrounding Blackman's threats, he was suffering from extreme emotional disturbance at the time of the homicide. One eyewitness testified, however, that during the attack, Troy Kell's demeanor was very businesslike, as cold as it gets. It was like he was doing a job. Based on his testimony, Troy Kell had asked the court to instruct the jury on the defense of imperfect self-defense manslaughter, but the court declined his request. 
The trial court did, however, instruct the jury on the lesser included offense of murder as well as aggravated murder. The jury unanimously found Troy Kell guilty of the aggravated murder charge and banged the gavel, sentencing him to death. I've only been here for one execution and it happened to be the firing squad. And to me, it seemed a cleaner, uh, faster way to go. Uh, the man didn't experience any kind of shit because they think it's like a medical thing. I, I got a problem with the way, I don't have a problem with the death penalty. Okay, it's in, in the sense of, of that's the penalty. Uh, but when they try to, you know, make it like a medical procedure, uh, like they're going into like an operation or something like that, I, you know, show it for what it is. You know, you're killing a guy, regardless of, of the justification. We can all justify our actions in one form or another. The fact is you're killing a guy. So show it for what it is. That's what it is. I think they should take it down to the Delta Center and, and show the public what, what exactly is going on. I really don't know. I hope, I hope a long time, but I, I go through that all the time. So I don't know. You go through what all the time? I go through with making the decision of, you know, living through this shit or, or not. Because I fucked my life off. So, I mean, I've been pissed off since I've been 18 years old. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Don't forget to share the video and make sure you leave a comment. A lot of people have been asking for this video about Troy Kell. Very controversial video, but a video that you asked for. And because I always say that we're a family and because we are, I'm going to do the video. We're going to talk about some things about this video. We're going to take a look at Troy Kell and the beginning of his prison life. Prison life that forever changed who he was as a person, in my opinion. June 13th, 1968. Was an American gladiator born? HBO wanted you to believe that. HBO wanted to bring... People prison content. They were kind of the first to really introduce this whole prison movement, right? They gave people a glimpse into what that world was like. A world that people on the outside probably had no idea was existing on the inside. Yeah, they thought prisoners worked out all the time and you know they had prison shanks and but they didn't know that people were dying in prison all the time. They didn't know that people died in prison every single day. They didn't know that, in the words of Troy Kell, that people fucked their lives off, right? But HBO brought it. They brought what the people wanted to see. We live in a culture where, since the beginning of time, where people root for the villain. How many times have you gone to the movies and rooted for the villain? You know, the gladiator days back in the day when the Romans would put people in a gladiator pit and make them fight to the death. And people would yell and they would scream and they would enjoy every bit of it. Why do we live in a culture that glamorizes violence? Why do we live in a culture that looks at prison as a place where the tough guys are? Troy Kell went to prison at the age of 18, sentenced to life. And I'm going to read a little bit of this and we're going to talk about it. Kell was originally imprisoned in the state of Nevada for the murder of 21-year-old James Cotton Kelly. Although tried for killing Kelly, the victim's real name was James Theed, a Canadian citizen who was under investigation for drug smuggling 
by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Some years later, Thede's mother, father, and uncle were federally indicted, both in Las Vegas and Toronto, for drug smuggling, all using the same alias, Kelly. In 1986, Kel, then age 18, was asked by his 15-year-old longtime friend, Sandy Shaw, to beat Cotton Kelly for relentlessly stalking Shaw for sex. Her mother had gone to the police earlier, but there were no stalking laws on the books at the time, which caused Shaw to turn to Kel, her childhood protector from her old neighborhood. Cotton Kelly drove with Shaw, Kel, and a third young man, Willie, Billy Merritt, into the desert where Kel shot Kelly six times in the face, killing him. The murder was dubbed the show and tell murder by Las Vegas media because Shaw and another team, David Fletcher, allegedly returned to the scene of the crime with their friends to see the corpse. One of the friends eventually reported the incident to the police, which led to the arrest and convictions of Shaw, Kell, and Merritt. And in the affidavit, which helped free Shaw after many years of incarceration, Fletcher said that Shaw never went back to the scene or took friends to see the body, but that he, Fletcher, did that without her knowing. Fletcher also admitted that District Attorney Dan Seaton got Fletcher to change his testimony and commit perjury at Shaw's trial because Seaton threatened him with prosecution for grand theft for taking the victim's expensive watch and ring. Fletcher further stated that he believed that his testimony was what convicted Shaw and expressed deep regret but also relief for coming forward after all those years. HBO, in cooperation with Blowback Productions, filmed that documentary. And they entitled it Gladiator Days, Anatomy of a Prison Murder. That was released in 2002. The title wanted to grab you. The title wanted to draw you in. The title wanted you to look as if we were the villains glorifying a murder, a prison murder. That's what they wanted, and that's what they got. Troy Kell. 18 years old, sentenced to life in prison. Did Troy Kell deserve to go to prison? You know that he did. He killed this dude. Is there a way of justifying why he killed him? Many people try to justify it. Oh, the guy was a sex offender. He was pressing Shaw to pose naked or to do this. But when you're 18 years old, you want to impress the girls, right? We've all been there. We've been there. What do you think Troy Kell was really doing? He was going to impress Sandy Shaw, wasn't he? Sandy Shaw reached out to him and said, Hey, I want your help. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've done a lot of research on this. I watched a lot of videos. I read the case. I read appeals in this case. I'm going to tell you what I think was going on. I think Troy Kell was Sandy Shaw's boyfriend. You can see it in her interview where she lights up. Or she says... You know, he said he was going into prison as a man, and he was going to leave as a man. Oh, he was going to leave in a body bag. But he was going to leave as a man. You see her face light up. He was her puppy love, the love of her life, probably the only love that she had ever known. She was only 15 when she went to prison for, what, the next 20 years? Troy Kell, that was her boyfriend. And old Shaw says, hey, look, this guy's doing this stuff to me. He wants me to pose naked. And he took it upon himself to take him out there and they shoot him. Troy Kell shoots him, kills him, kills him in cold blood. But we can always go back to what the Supreme Court says, too, about people at the age of 18 that they have a mind and a brain that hasn't fully developed. And a lot of times, youngsters make irrational, irresponsible choices. And I'll be here to tell you, and I don't like to say this, but sometimes... You have to just call it how it is, right? Like I say, the show's real and it's raw. So I have to say the truth. Troy Kell deserved to go to prison. And he deserved a significant sentence. But when they slammed the gavel and gave Troy Kell life in prison, at 18 years old, he probably laid in his cell that night and looked at the ceiling. And he probably started counting on his fingers. He was just a young man. I'll probably live 60 or 70 years. That means I'll be in prison for 70 years. I'll be 88 when I die. I can guarantee you that he laid on his bunk and he counted the 
years and he counted the days and he thought about the misery that he was going to live. And now he formed in his mind an image, an image that he had to protect. Told people, I'm going to prison a man and I'm going to come out a man. And you know, he says it in the documentary, you heard it. He says, I wasn't going into prison to wash people's clothes or, yeah, he said it, or suck people's dicks. I was going to be a man in here. One way or the other, I was going to be a man. So he created this image where maybe he thought he was going to walk in and be a gladiator. And he went in there and he conducted himself like that. Commit numerous prison violations, acts of violence. And you know, sometimes that's a defense mechanism. Sometimes it is. And after you watch the Troy Kell documentary, right? I know I don't say it the right way. Go ahead and laugh. After you watch that, you think, maybe I don't respect everything that Troy Kell did in his life, but I respect some of the things that he said. Instead of looking at him as the racist or the guy that just hates black people, I looked at him as a person and I listened to his words. I listened to the things that he said. And I know what he was experiencing because I experienced it. He went to prison with a life sentence. Life forever gone. He was going to spend his life behind bars for forever. For 60 or 70 years. His mind was racing. His heart was pumping. And there was probably something in the back of his mind where he thought, man, I might win an appeal. I'm going to win my appeal. Most guys that go in with life think that. I'm going to win my appeal. I'm going to get out of here. This isn't going to be my life. But when the appeals start to get denied, the lawyer starts telling you, because the lawyers will tell you, we're not going to win this, man. We're going to give it a shot, but we're probably not going to win. Lawyers really tell you that shit. Troy Kell knew. He knew that his life was over. He knew that this was it, and he began to live that prison life. Perhaps he began to live that prison life that he had imagined in his mind what it was like. Playing cards, not getting raped, smoking cigarettes. It was still glamorized in his mind. He was going to work out. He was glamorizing prison in his mind and trying to convince himself that he was going to be okay, but he wasn't okay. And that's what we do. That's what our government does. That's what the states do. Maybe the dude didn't deserve to die. Maybe they should have just took him out there in the desert and kicked his ass, right? If the allegations were true. But I think Troy Kell was just trying to impress his little young girlfriend and his friends. I'm that dude. That's why he killed that dude out in the desert. He killed him because I'm that dude, man. I'm going to impress you guys. He didn't realize how serious the consequences were. He didn't realize that he would be spending the rest of his life in prison for murder when he got out of that car and he shot that guy in the face, what, six times? He wasn't thinking about the consequences. But Chad, he was 18 years old. He knew what the consequences were. Yeah, but in his young mind, what do we call that? Mollification? He justified it. And then he believed that he wouldn't get caught. But look how ignorant they are. Young kids, they go back to look at the body? Are you kidding me? They tell a friend, this is what happens. This is what young people do. They don't think rationally. Number one, they don't think rationally when they kill the guy. Number two, they don't think rationally after they do it. They tell everybody about it. They go back to look at the body as if it's something cool. Something's wrong up here. Troy Kell thought he was going to get away with it. Probably didn't even think he was going to shoot him, but in the moment, he was trying to protect that image, the image that he had already projected, that he was the baddest dude around. But I'm the cool guy. Remember that guy of Bad News Bears? He'd ride up on his little dirt bike and I think he was smoking a cigarette, had a tattoo on his arm. Think back then. That was Troy Kell. I'm the toughest guy around. And it cost him his life. And Troy Kell goes to prison. And I've seen this a thousand times. Troy Kell goes to prison, projecting that same tough guy image. Like I said earlier, gets involved in a bunch of incidents, does a bunch of bullshit, works his way to a maximum security, hardcore lockdown. And then they say, you know what, Troy Kell, we've had enough of you here in Nevada. We're going to do the prisoner transfer program. <clears throat> 
You're not from Utah. It's not too far away, but we're going to send you over there and let you do your time over there. We're going to throw you in a maximum security unit. We're going to make life hard for you, son. We don't believe that you're redeemable. And I believe that most people are redeemable, especially an 18-year-old kid. But how do you justify it? How do you say that Troy Kell shouldn't die in prison when this other guy died out in the desert? Some people might say, well, when you kill someone, you don't deserve a second chance to reclaim your life. I disagree. I also believe that there should be harsh consequences, but I believe in rehabilitation. I believe that if you can be rehabilitated, you should be released from prison. There has to be some punishment or else we'd live in a lawless land. But I don't think they should have gave Troy Kell until the sun burns out. I think they should have given him an opportunity to change his life, to prove himself. But when they took that away, he became a danger to himself and to others. They began to live that prison life. He makes it to Utah and makes it into this maximum security unit. We're gonna talk about his co-defendant too. And we're gonna talk about how Troy Kell uses the words, I fucked my whole life off. And I respect that statement. He fucked his whole life off at 18 years old. And there's so many dudes around that go to prison that fuck their whole lives off, right? Including Troy Kell's co-defendant. We're going to talk about him too. We're going to talk about him now, actually, because it's important. It's important, young man, if you're watching this video that you listen to what I'm going to tell you. We're going to talk about the murder and why it happened. We're going to talk about the things that they don't tell you in the media. Or they don't mention in the court papers because it doesn't fit the narrative. Eric Daniels goes to prison for forgery, right? Steals a sheriff's checkbook, signs his name on it. They give him zero to five years in prison, nonviolent offender. And they throw him in a unit, prison, on, where there's a bunch of dudes that are going to be executed. He's in a death row unit, man. You've seen the documentary. They're over there. They're smashing windows out. They're breaching the officer's station. This kid becomes an animal. But is he also trying to protect himself? Is he joining in? on the reindeer games for a reason, because he doesn't want these people to take advantage of him, these killers that they've intermingled him with. And I can guarantee you, and don't forget this fact, that if it wasn't a sheriff's checkbook, I don't think Eric Daniels would have went to prison. And I damn sure don't think he would have ended up in a unit like that. A unit with dudes that were serving life, dudes that were gonna be executed. And then he became a product of his environment. Again, he was doing things in outbursts and kicking the doors and smashing glass because he wanted to project, hey, man, I'm a tough guy too. Maybe he was scared. I've seen so many people do that in prison, tattoo their face. It's a defense mechanism, man. I can guarantee you that Eric was using what we call a defense mechanism to keep other people off him. He joined in the reindeer games, games that cost him his life. You hear stories all the time, right? But you never see their faces. You hear the stories about the Eric's of this world that go to prison with two or three years and then they end up with life. But you never see who it is. Well, now you do. You've seen it in the documentary. You've seen it with Troy Kell. So what happens in that secure unit, right? I'll tell you what happens. Things that you guys don't know. Things that you guys don't see. Things that I've seen. Things that I've experienced. You know, I've been in the hole. I've done over a year in the hole. I've done 90 days here and 60 days there and 13 months here and 14 months there. The hole can be a nasty, nasty place where dudes have no respect. They're on the door. They're kicking the door. 11, 12 o'clock at night, screaming, yelling. Dudes are up with their cellies playing cards. You hear cards slamming on the, on the table. You've got other guys in there hitting beats and rapping at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you get dudes in the hole, talked about the white dude before, just screams at 2, 3 in the morning. Ah! You can't sleep, man. Then people start beefing. Hey, man, why don't you keep that shit down? Man, fuck you. Don't tell me how to do my time. And a lot of people think when you're locked in a cell, I'm never going to see you, man. Again, the young mind. I'll never see you again. We'll never be face to face. We're locked down. You got life. I got a couple years. I'm getting out of here. So you know what? Fuck you. And what do they call them people? Cell gangsters? 
people that just talk shit back and forth because they know that door is there. And that's what happened. That's what happened with Troy Kell and Blackman, right? Blackman, when you watch the documentary, they try to paint it as, hey, man, and I'm not saying this guy deserved to die. And we're going to talk about racism in a minute, too. They paint the picture. They want you to see this picture that Troy Kell is this American gladiator. He's this prison killer. He's the guy that you don't ever want to be around. He's the guy that you want to avoid. He'll kill you in a minute, stab you in a minute without any remorse. And that's what he did on this day. They started arguing. I used to tell people this, you know. My brother told me this a long time ago. He said, sometimes we have an agreement, right? We're beefing. We got a problem with each other. We're arguing. And we come to this agreement where when we see each other, it's on. And you end up with the short end of the stick, so to say. And then you tell the cops, you call the police. Then you're not so happy with the outcome. And I'm not saying that specifically about this situation. But sometimes you're not happy with the outcome, but you want to talk shit to me. And now the doors pop. Now it's just me and you. We get in a fist fight. You don't win. I do. Now you're upset. Now you're mad. But I thought we had an agreement. We were both cool with it when we were talking shit. And now it went all the way bad. So did Troy Kell kill this guy because he was a racist? Because he hated black people? Because he hated African Americans? I don't believe that. Do I believe that Troy Kell was a separatist? 100%. Do I believe that he just hates people? No. Do I believe that racism is a taught behavior, a learned behavior? I do. And there's racism on all sides, man. There's racism on all sides. But I don't think that guy, I don't think Blackman died over race. I think he died over them two dudes beefing on the gate. These guys concoct this little plan. We're going to get him out of the cell. We're going to go to medical. And I'm going to butcher this dude. Probably disrespected him on the door. I guarantee they were calling each other bitches. You know, some guys don't, though. Some guys are like, hey, man, don't argue on the gate. I'm going to see you when I see you, man. Don't get mad when I do. And Blackman, what, he was in Arkansas, got transferred over to Utah. He had some assaults. He had some violent shit going on. Assaulted staff, assaulted, you know, cops. Same thing as Troy Kell. Maybe both of these dudes were American gladiators. If you let HBO tell it. But I don't see it that way. I see it as two young men. Lost, man. Two young men incarcerated. Not working together, but working against each other. To hurt each other instead of working together for the greater cause. To get out of prison. To get off a lockdown. To not live like this. To get better food. Together we'll conquer as one will fail. Neither one of them men seen it that way. And so many lives were lost, man. And you watch the documentary and you see Blackman's father on there and you see his brother talking. They lost a son, man. They lost a brother. They lost somebody that they loved and someone that they cared about. Inside of an environment where the public is told that the prison's job is safety and security. Where they want you to believe that people are safe in there, that they're secure. Not always the truth, man. In so many cases, it's not the truth. On that fateful day, Blackman was viciously stabbed, viciously killed, held down, handcuffed. I can't imagine what it's like, man, to be handcuffed and be stabbed and you can't do anything. All you can do is try to kick and then another man grabs you. I've talked about this in Big Sandy before, right? When they grabbed Mikey Eck, DWB held him on the ground and stabbed him in the eyes. I can't imagine what it feels like. I don't want you to ever be in that position where you're on the door and you're beefing with a Troy Kell. No. It's not the life you want to live. You look at this, right? You know, we talked about the kid, his co-defendant, Eric. Eric lost his life. Sentenced to life in prison. Went in with zero to five. <laughs> Now he's in New Jersey hiding and he's in a Christian band talking about how he's given his life over. And I hope that he has. I hope that he has. 
Because the life that he's lived now and the life that Troy Keller's lived was misery. The, tr the life that Lonnie Blackman lived was misery. Locked in a cell. What is it, 23 hours a day, seven days a week? It's horrible, man, to live like that. These dudes had pent-up anger. And instead of channeling it in the right way, they channeled it against each other. And in the end, all those lives were lost. Let's read some of Troy Kell's statements. Troy says, any kind of white guy that stands up for his people, he is looked upon as some type of racist, a race hater. And that's not the case. He says, there are more white people that need adjusting than anyone else. I've seen that, man. You know, I've had some issues in prison, and almost every single time that I had an issue, it was with my own people, man. And so many of them need adjusting. But what type of adjusting? That's the prison life. People get adjusted in prison. People get adjusted in prison. Was Troy Kell, was it possible to rehabilitate this kid? Had he not been given 25 years, or had he not been given life? Had he been sentenced to 25 years? For murder, would he have had a different outlook? Would he have become the Troy Kell that HBO tried to glamorize as a gladiator? As a killer? As a racist? Perhaps his life would have taken a different course. And you know, so many people that watch these shows, you know that there are so many prosecutors out there that are nasty. They do nasty things. Not all, but many. No compassion. They see it one way. They see the glass half empty instead of half full. You did this crime, I want to smash you. I want to send you to prison for the rest of your life. And that brings me back to Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams, nonviolent drug offender, pleads guilty. Lawyer tells him pleads gu plead guilty. He goes into a North Carolina courtroom, pleads guilty, and gets sentenced to life for a nonviolent drug offense. Mandatory life. The prosecutor put the bolts in. And when you listen to the prosecutor in the Troy Kell case, this was a gruesome, gruesome murder. Make no mistake about it. But he wants to put the bolts. He wants people to, he wants to paint this picture where we glorify the death penalty, where we glorify putting people to death. It's crazy, man. I don't think Lonnie should have been put to death inside a prison unit. I don't think he should have been stabbed. I don't think he should have been handcuffed and not able to fight back. I don't believe in that, man. And I don't believe in propaganda either. I don't believe some of the pictures that they try to paint. That's what they want you to see. They want to justify putting the screws to people. And remember how he was a little bit sarcastic about Eric? Well, he shouldn't have stole the check from a sheriff. When he steals the check from the sheriff, I, of course, we're going to lock him up and throw away the key. Another ignorant young man steals a check, goes to prison, gets involved in a murder, and there he goes. Verbal confrontations happen all the time in prison. And so many times in the shoe, so many times in a lockup segregation type of setting. Why? Because you're in your cell, you're pacing back and forth, you're angry. The shit hurts, man. The shit hurts. And sometimes you just want to lash out. You want to yell at somebody. You want to talk shit to somebody. And so many times us as prisoners, we talk shit to the wrong people. We talk shit to each other instead of once again working for that common goal. You know, Blackman's in that unit. And, you know, it's on video. There's no getting around it, right? The cops don't show up for five minutes, man. They just brutally stab this kid. This man. They brutally stabbed somebody's son. Perhaps somebody's father. Someone's brother. And nobody comes to respond. But they tell you that their job is safety and security of the facility. Should the cops have ran in there? There's two or three of them in that little dome in there. If their job is safety and security, they should have ran their asses in there and saved his life. But they don't give a shit about you, man. Troy Kell says, the way I live my life, eventually someone will get me if the state does not. He lived, a, he lived the life that he painted. He created this. Remember the brother I had on from Detroit? 
got to take responsibility for your actions at some point. Does Troy Kell do that in some of the video? Some of it he does. Remember when he tells the cops, you guys are going to see the Oscar Award winning performance day, and he gets on the stand, he starts crying, and then he tells you, you know, I was fighting for my life. I think there's truth to that. But I think it was also him trying to put on that image again. He had to put the armor on that. He was trying to protect that image, so he had to put the armor on. He didn't want the cops to think he was a punk when he got up there and started crying. Well, I think his feelings were hurt that he killed the dude. I've seen some vicious dudes, some cold-hearted dudes cry, man. I've seen some cold-hearted dudes have emotions. Most people do, man. It's the way God made us. Did he get up there and put on a award a winning performance? I think he meant it when he cried. I do. And he wanted to save and protect his image that he projected to the cops that Troy Kell was some badass dude, man. But how badass was he when the cops came in? He laid on the ground. They put the shield on him and laid him on the ground, right? Why did he keep fighting? The American Gladiator. The American Gladiator that HBO painted that picture for you. It's a messed up case, man. So many people lost their lives. And there's a young man out there, perhaps a young woman, just like Shaw. Maybe you're watching this video. Maybe you guys think that you're going to team up and go rob some dude, and, you know, even if it's true or not. And say, hey, man, he's been sexually uh, assaulting me or, you know, he's been making these comments. He wants me to pose naked, so let's go rob him. And then he accidentally dies. And now your ass is sitting in prison. And now your ass is getting a death sentence. Think about it, man. Think about it. Some people probably wanted me to come on here and glorify Troy Kell and glorify what Troy Kell did. Some people might not like it that I didn't do that. I'm not glorifying Troy Kell. I'm not doing that. Was he a dangerous dude? Yes. Did the state create a monster? I think they did. I think when they give an 18-year-old life, I don't care if he's black or Hispanic or white, or Mexican, or Chinese, or Asian, or Latin. I think that you begin to create a monster. I do. And we're going to talk about another situation. Another guy that our government sent to a war. We'll talk about that in another video. And he does something gruesome. And I was with this dude. And eventually he hung himself in prison. He killed himself. He took his life. But I talked to him in depth about his crime and the things that he did. And I'm going to share that with you. We're going to do that in another video. But our government creates these monsters. When they tell you you're 18 years old, you did a horrendous crime, and you're not rehabilitatable. We're just going to throw away the key. We're going to feed you bread and water. And when you lash out, we got something for you. We won't give you the death penalty. Go ahead and lash out. You think the cops really care about that stuff? You think people really care about that? They get a guy like Blackman, he's a Criminal, according to the prosecutor, right? You got this other Troy Kell. He's a criminal. He's a vicious killer. And in their minds, do you think they're thinking, wow, we can kill two birds with one stone? Do you think they're thinking that? Blackman's dead. Troy Kell, we're going to kill him. Eric, we're going to send him to prison for the rest of his life. Shaw, we're going to send her for 20-something years. Killing all these birds with one stone. All the people that the prosecutor think are undesirables. But I think every single one of them, Lonnie Blackman, Troy Kell, I think them people were redeemable. But they weren't given the rehabilitation that they needed, man. Don't be Troy Kell. That's the moral of the story is, don't be that guy that fucks his whole life off. Don't be Eric. Go to prison with zero to five years and fuck your whole life off because you're creating an image that you feel you have to protect. And a lot of times in prison, when you create that image, you do have to protect it. The dude created an image, man. He wanted to be with the other guys, the cool guys, the guys that had already fucked their lives off. He wanted to be like them in the sense where he was a tough guy. But I guarantee you, he didn't want to fuck his whole life off. I guarantee you that there was some Hope in his heart that someday he'd get out of prison when he laid in that cell at night. And he'd be able to take a girl to the movies or buy a car or maybe have a son. 
but it's all gone, man. This life is fucked off. I don't want to see you fuck your life off, man. Troy Kell, forever gone. Lonnie Blackman, forever gone. Don't be those guys, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out.